My name's John. I'm one of the pastors. It's been a joy to be a part of this church family for the past seven years. And um, whew, seven years biblically is the number of completion. I hope that doesn't mean God's done. Now that I think about it, but eight is the biblical number of new beginnings. Amen. Okay, so good. That's good. Everyone breathe a sigh of relief. Why don't you stand to your feet with me as we get ready to read and honor God's word. We're in the midst of a series called The Awakening. Everybody say The Awakening. The Awakening, we're going through the book of Acts. We've dialogued in this series about how this world is in trouble. Can I get an amen? This world is in trouble and we are longing for things that only awakening can solve. We've been dialoguing on this single phrase that we see in the book of Acts. If God did it before, revival, awakening, transformation, he did it in Acts, he did it in modern history, and if he did it before, he can do it Again, come on, somebody. Y'all tracking with me. The, the, the question last week was, what are the marks of this awakening? What does it look like? We talked about how awakening is Jesus-centered. It's action-oriented, and it is spirit-empowered that Jesus kicked off this great awakening, and we follow his lead. If you missed it, you can check it out on our podcast or our YouTube channel. This week, as we reflect on seven years of God's faithfulness, seven years of God's grace, seven years of God using a bunch of ragtag, ordinary, jacked up individuals here at Greenhouse to do supernatural things because he's that amazing. I wanna talk about how. I wanna talk about the how of this great awakening. This morning, I wanna talk about power. Turn your neighbor and say power. Turn your neighbor and say in Spanish, say poder, poder. It just sounds better like that, right? La lengua de los cielos, amen, amen, gloria. Power, Acts chapter one, if you've got a Bible, turn to verse six. If not, Sky Bible is up on the screen for your viewing enjoyment. And if you're ready, say preach, preacher. All right. It says, then they gathered together around him, him being Jesus, and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom or the power to Israel? I'll explain what's going on there in a second. But Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive, everybody say it, power. Say it again. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. By the way, that is precisely what happened because when God speaks, It happens. Amen? You take that one to the bank. After this, Jesus was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Say, freak me out. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. Where'd he go? And when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? Although I think the answer is pretty self-explanatory, but anyways, not the point. This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Let's pray. Jesus, speak through your word and remind us of who you are and who we are in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn your neighbor, give him a high five, an elbow bump, a fist bump, or a kiss on the lips, depend, lips on, depending on your connection with them. If you're married, you can go ahead. And say, thank you, Pastor John. If not, don't try that. That's awkward. You ever watch power go to somebody's head? Anybody ever seen that before? Power, some of you are nudging your spouse right now. That is not a smart idea. I think the power just went to your head. But if you've ever encountered this, it is quite a sight to behold. I remember in elementary school, I had a friend named Dustin Goldman. Dustin Goldman was my buddy. We would hang out. We'd do sleepovers. We would play Power Rangers, which apparently is still around. Talk about staying power, goodness gracious. So we would, we, would, we would hang out, but I remember the day that Dustin Goldman was given the illustrious privilege of what we did in elementary school called the line leader. Anybody have the line leader growing up? He was the line leader. Now the line leader was largely a, uh, a ploy by educators of positive reinforcement or a Hail Mary of please God, let this work and change this kid's behavior around, right? The line, now for Dustin Goldman, his was the latter, not the former. He was not exactly the standard of upright behavior, but he tried his best. And I remember the day that Dustin Dustin Goldman became the line leader. It was a day I would never forget. 
You, I could have sworn Dustin Goldman was told that he had been crowned the empire of the modern world because I've never seen this small amount of power. He Dwight shrewded it so hard. I've never seen this small amount of power, the office, right? I've never seen this small amount of power go to someone's head so quickly. I mean, this kid was, he was out of his mind. We, he, he, he demanded the basketball during recess. We're like, what are you talking about? He's like, I'm, the, I'm the line leader. Okay. He, he would ask for trades during lunch that were preposterous. I'm talking like, hey, I'll trade you fruit snacks for my turkey cheese sandwich. People are like, what? Have you lost your mind? He's like, I'm the line leader. I remember by the end of the day, we collectively gathered in, in, our, in our elementary school glory, and we were like, teacher, we just need you to promise us one thing. Dustin Goldman cannot be the line leader ever again. He can't handle the power. Some of you know somebody like that, maybe. Maybe some of you are somebody like that, maybe a little bit more circumspect. Here's my point. We live in a world obsessed with power. We're doing car research, and we want to find the car that's got the most horse power. And we go, we've got, you know, sections flooded with self-help books, and we'll, we'll pull out the Atomic Habits book because we want to develop and fine-tune our will power. We don't stop, by the way, when it comes to having power over ourselves. No, we want power over others as well. We want to climb the ranks at our job. We want to build clout and influence on social media. We live in a world in which the biggest career ambition of almost every 15-year-old right now is what? They don't want to be a professional athlete anymore. And they don't want to be a superstar. They want to be a social media influencer. Teachers, am I right? Everyone's like, what are you going to do for a living? YouTube. Because I'm amazing and everyone wants to watch videos of me endlessly. And they will pay me to do it. We live in a world obsessed with power. This seemingly unchecked yearning for power, clout, influence. But if we were to just pause for a moment and be a bit more circumspect, we would realize that this obsession with power, this craving and longing for power, it's actually destroying us. Because history has taught us over and over and over again that when we get power, eventually and inevitably, we abuse and misuse that same power we received. Maybe you've experienced it. I bet you have. Somebody in your life that had power and, and maybe not even a bad person, but, but they misuse power in some sort of a way. We've all experienced the misuse of power. Maybe for you it was a boss or a parent, a guardian, a teacher, a peer. And it's easy to point the fingers, but most likely if you're a person, like I'm a person, homo sapiens in the room, anybody, human beings, all right, cool. Not everybody, which I don't really know how to feel about that, but... I guess preach the good news to all creation. Uh, most likely, you have also abused and misused power yourself. It's not a religious thing, it's a human thing. Due to our confusion about power and authority, we have clamored after a power on this earth that if we are ever to actually obtain us, it destroys us from the inside out. Can anybody relate to that? I've got one big idea. If you're taking notes, I'd encourage you to jot this down and we'll unpack it during the course of the next several moments together. Here is my thought for the morning. It takes holy power to redeem power. It takes holy power to redeem power. You're like, John, what in the world are you talking about? Let me try to explain. Point number one is this. We crave power. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's true. It's true. Maybe not for you, but maybe for your neighbor. It's, it's true. We crave power power. It starts in verse 6. Then they, being the disciples, gathered around Jesus, and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, the context for this passage matters because it sort of helps us understand what exactly is happening here in this interaction between Jesus and the disciples. See, in ancient Israel, there was an ancient empire that was basically conquering the majority of the known world at this point. Anyone know what empire that was? The Rome, very good, y'all Bible scholars. The Roman Empire. The Roman Empire would come in. They had this incredible road system where they would interconnect their kingdom and it allowed them to span all over in unprecedented ways out in the ancient world. And the Roman Empire, while they were very powerful, were not particularly known for being merciful. 
And so the Jewish people were living under oppression. They were living under political oppression. They were living under socioeconomic oppression. They were being taxed way higher than they thought was rational. And so there was this yearning and longing within the ancient Jewish people, within the people of God, that the Messiah, the Mashiach, his Hebrew name, why don't you try saying that with me? Everybody say Mashiach. There we go. If your neighbor just went like that, you did it right, okay? The, 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 the Messiah, the Mashiach in Hebrew, that, that he would come and he would kick the Romans out of there and he would finally restore power to the Jewish people. See, there's nothing new under the sun. It's kind of the way of this world that, that we see that people end up obtaining power and then they use power for their own means, to their own ends, for their own personal kingdom. And these disciples of Jesus are no strangers to this reality. They're living in it. So what do they do? And I need you to cue in here because the disciples do actually what we all do when we're in this situation. They assume that the solution is only one thing. We need the power. They assume this, some of you laughed, you're like, oh, that's so preposterous, but it's what we do. They assume the solution is, well, if we just had the power, then everything would be better. The disciples who have experienced this abuse of power are asking in turn for the same power because this is what we do as humans. By the way, this is not ain't just ancient disciples. This is modern humans as well. This is the postmodern justice theory essentially is espoused on this same idea. It's, it's sort of predicated on the notion that, that people who have th power and authority need to be dismantled. Now, that is true for some people who have power and authority. They do need to be dismantled. Lord have mercy. But the problem is not in that aspect, but it is in the solution. The, the solution of the sort of the postmodern justice theory theory is that if we've got people in power, then you just need to swap and put some other humans in power, which begs the question, what would the difference be? You put in different people who are just as broken, maybe in different ways, but with their own issues. And so the question is, what would keep the new person in power from doing the same things that the old person in power used to do? Are you guys tracking with me? And you know what the answer is? You know what history has told us? What would keep them from doing it? Nothing. Nothing. We've run the experiment at this point. The disciples are like, Jesus, these Romans, you know about the old oh, Jesus. You know about these, you know all things, Lord. You know about these Romans. When are you gonna hand over the power to us? Because we're gonna make it right. Because we're gonna do it different. And what we found in the human experience is that so often those abused by power turn around and abuse with power. I know this sounds like bad news, but you got to get the bad news in order to get the good news. Check out this quote from a famous world leader. I want to see if you can guess who it is. This world leader said, today Christians stand at the head of this country. And I pledge that I will never tie myself to parties who want to destroy Christianity. We want to fill our culture again with the Christian spirit. Does that sound good to anybody else? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, the Christian spirit. We want to burn out the recent immoral developments in literature, theater, and the press. In short, we want to burn out the poison of immorality which has entered into our whole life and culture as a result of excesses during the past few years. Can anyone guess who this ancient, it's not modern, ancient politician was? Adolf Hitler. You hear these words, we want, to, we want to renew again the Christian spirit to our land. What in the world? I, I, I found myself going down this exceptionally depressing rabbit hole as I was preparing for our time together. As I started, I'm like, Ad what in the, Adolf Hitler? I'm from a Jewish background. I'm like, that's like the... Oh my goodness, the devil incarnate. I start looking into world leaders. It's like, the, it's like the framework for almost every horrible dictator in human, in human history. They've had, the, they started out so good. Most of the times they started out, they were poor. They were oppressed. They got into power because they were representing the people, because they had a vision that they were gonna distribute power, that they were gonna stand up for the, for the small guy, for the little guy. They were gonna make things better. It's, I mean, over and over, I, I got through like 10 names all throughout. It was the Eastern world and the Western world and the ancient world. I was just depressed. I'm like, I got to go pray now just to get back in the spirit. 
We see it with crooked politicians. They often started out so good with such great ideals. You wanna take it in a more heartbreaking way, you look into people who have been victims of crimes or victims of abuse who turn around and then perpetrate some of those same things against others. Friends, we as humans, we have a track record. We have a history when it comes to power, and it is not good. There's a problem here. We've shown it over and over again. We experience an abuse of power, and then we assume that the answer to solve this abuse of power is that we just need the power, because we would never do that, because we would do it right. But history has proven this is not true because humans are humans. John Acton has a famous quote. You've probably heard it before. Power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts. You've heard it before, right? Doesn't this resonate as true? Isn't there something that's stuck around for so long because they're like, man, that's, that, hit, that happens, doesn't it? The question is Why? Why does that happen? The Bible actually has an answer because the Bible is true and God has given us an insight into humanity that is more profound than any book that's ever been written before. See, the scripture tells us that it's not just power that corrupts. The reality is if left to ourselves and our own devices, we are actually corrupted already on the inside. And what power does is it simply gives that corruption a chance to manifest and run free. What's up with this universal craving for power because we were made for it? Go back to the Garden of Eden at the very beginning of our story. God said to Adam, I've given you dominion. I've given you authority. I've given you power over everything that you see. We were made for this power. We were made for dominion in the Garden of Eden under submission of the Holy Spirit, but it got corrupted because of sin, which brings us to our modern condition. And when left to ourselves, we don't know what to do with power, so we abuse power and we misuse power. We crave power, point number one, but this brings us to point number two. We need a holy power. Turn to your neighbor and say, holy, santo, holy power. We need a holy, I don't know why so much Spanish right now. Um, I'm hearing my wife teaching it in, in, the, in the room, Senora Lash here. My son Liam is a, uh, is right now obsessed with power in battery form. He has discovered, our son Liam, he's five years old, he's our oldest, he has discovered the wonder of batteries. Any parents of like young kids or parents that remember when your kids were young, any parents out there? No, okay, three, y'all don't wanna claim your kids? That's cool, that's fine, that's fine. Everyone's like, mm, nope. Nope, I'm not, no, no, no. Uh, my son is really into batteries, which is fantastic because all of the toys that use batteries are mind-blowingly loud and obnoxious. Thank you, God, for all of our incredible friends who have gotten us these battery-powered toys. And so my son has discovered the wonder of batteries. Just this week, he was rummaging through the cupboards. For a split second, I thought he was trying to clean, and I was like, who am I talking about? This is my son. Um, and so I was like, bud, what are you doing? He's like, dad, my laptop needs three A batteries. Three A bat, triple A bat. That's what he's saying. And he doesn't have a real laptop. It's like a little Spider-Man thing, all right? We're not crazy. We're not those crazy parents, okay? And so he's there looking, and he's like going through the drawer, and he found a drawer of batteries. I didn't even know they were in there, so I was like, great, thanks for helping me clean, son. And uh, he, he's pulling them all out. I didn't have the heart to tell him. They were all AA batteries. There was like 20 of them, and he was just going through it. So I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah son, <laughs> go for it. Hope, oh, please, God, don't let him find AAA batteries because that laptop is so loud. I'm not a bad parent, okay? I love my kids. I just don't love those batteries, and so I finally was like, bud, you know, your laptop is broken. Um, the batteries don't work. I, I, I'm pretty sure that's true. And um, I said, you know, the batteries don't work. I said, but, but all the batteries that you have, he, he didn't realize yet. And I had to explain to him, son, it's not just that your laptop needs power. Your laptop doesn't need power. Your laptop needs the right power. Not just any battery is going to solve the, 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 the problem. Not just any battery is going to do the trick. It's not just that we crave power. It is absolutely incumbent on us, utterly necessary, word nerd, SAT word. We don't just need power. We need the right power. Jesus hits on this. 
They say, Lord, are you gonna give us back the power? Are you gonna give us back the kingdom? Are you gonna give us back? And he says, listen, it's not for you to know the days or the times the Father has set, but you will receive power when what? When the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. I think we need a little, to be a little bit more honest in this season. A lot of other spirits, if you wanna use this language, have come upon us in this season. We've watched selfish spirits and lustful spirits, greedy spirits and fearful spirits, divisive spirits, all kinds of spirits have exercised authority and dominion and we have watched others and we have watched ourselves act in ways that we never thought we would. But I want us to hear the words of Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, when he comes, you get real power. You get holy power. All these other spirits, they'll give you a little, a little zap, a little jolt, a little justification. They'll feed into our rage or our anger, our offense or our defense, but the Holy Spirit is different. You say, John, how do you know the difference? You know the difference by the fruit. Paul writes about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the fruits of God's Spirit. And the warning when it comes to power is clear. Beware of allowing the wrong spirit to come upon you. So let's go back to their question for a moment. Jesus, will you at this time restore the kingdom? Will you at this time restore the power, the authority to Israel? It's easy to look at that and be like, man, what a dumb question. You know, every teacher's like, there's no bad questions. And if someone asks one, you're like, that was a bad question. Lord, will you at this time restore the power to Israel? Here's our problem. We keep settling for this world's plans for power when God already has a better plan. For instance, let's take their scenario here. God had a plan. God told us that his plan had always been to bless this entire world. He tells Abraham, through you, Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. God has a plan, and his plan is for all of the people groups. We see in Revelation, God's family is every tribe, tongue, color, nation, and language. God's family, if you look around right now and you're seeing all these different people, it looks like the UN gone spiritual, right? You're like, man, this is beautiful. This is God's plan. God had a plan for how he wanted his power to be man manifest through a people. And his point was to make this people, the people of God, the Jewish people, to make them a blessing. He said, I'm going to bless you so that you can in turn be a blessing. But here's the problem. Humans, you and I, always get stuck at the be blessed part of the equation. And they had gotten to this point where they felt like the whole point of everything was that they would be blessed. And so they said, God, we're not being blessed right now. We need you to give us the power. We look out for our people and our stuff and our scenario. But ultimately, this whole thing was about a God, God who loves the world. And it was about his kingdom and his plan and his glory. It's a warning to beware of thinking that your kingdom and God's kingdom are the same thing. And Jesus is reminding the disciples back then and giving word to the disciples right now that there is only one person who has what it takes to redeem power. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. It's, it's his power. It's ultimately not just enough to say, man, well, if we just had power, we could change everything in this world. If we just had a little bit more power, John, we could make everything right. If we just had more power, you don't just need power, friends. We've run that experiment in the human history. It doesn't end well. We don't just need power. We need holy power. You wanna see great awakening, you need holy power. You wanna see your family transform, you need holy power. You wanna see God's kingdom break out in your office space, you need holy power. We wanna see righteousness and justice flow like a mighty river, we need holy power. Come on, we need holy power. His kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. It's one of the reasons I love the book of Acts because it is a story of God's power on display. The book of Acts isn't a story about a bunch of like supernatural, extraordinary, super spiritual people that hover out of bed and just float around. And, I mean, these are some very ordinary dudes. Any of y'all read the Gospels before? You're reading about Peter. Peter gets called the devil at one point. I mean, these guys, they missed it all the time. 
This is not the story about some superhuman people. This is a story about some very human people who tapped into a superhuman God and the power of his spirit. I'm thinking about Greenhouse as we celebrate seven years today. Seven years of watching God move. And, and you're like, John, what, what, seven years of what? It's seven years of, of kind of the same reality of Acts. It's seven years of God working. It's seven years of his power and his glory and his incredible work and his incredible redemption power. And I started thinking about, God, God, look at all that you've done. I remember coming here at, when we launched at Western and being here, and, and Tedja was up there playing Cajon, and him and Jamie were singing worship, like the Indian version of Shane and Shane. And I was like, man, this is awesome. And I remember moving down, and we were trying to figure out what in the world we were doing. And, and I started thinking. I started tabulating. I'm like, man, let me just start collecting stories. We've collected some stories. And, and over the past seven years since we've launched here at Western, God has done some amazing things, and it's been just like the book of Acts, through a bunch of very ordinary, faithful, good-hearted people that by the grace and power of his spirit, I, I look back, I was curious. In the last seven years, we've had 176 people go all in with Jesus through baptism. Yeah, 176 people. Now, those aren't just numbers there. Some of you are like, that, that, that was me. That happened to me. These are lives that have been transformed. These are marriages that have been restored. These are families that have been made whole. Why? Because Jesus is just that amazing. Because Jesus is just that incredible. Because he took a bunch of ordinary people like you and I and used us in extraordinary ways by the power of his spirit. Over the past seven years, we've been able to give away right here from South Florida over $1 million to missions, church planting, and the poor. Listen, we, we got like 40% of our church is probably college students, y'all. Like, we're, we don't got it like that. It's a bunch of ordinary people who have extraordinary hearts of generosity. These are things like rescuing kids out of human trafficking with missionary Sam and Life for the Innocent, caring for and empowering the homeless towards restoration, providing mentoring and tutoring to break cycles of generational poverty right here in South Florida, fostering a discipleship movement and microchurch planning in Guyana. Shout out to the Guyana crew joining us online right now. God's been doing all sorts of incredible things. This is in an indigenous church planting movement all throughout East Africa where they're doing life skills training and subsistence farming training and, and they're reaching into communities and tribes that have never before heard the gospel. Warring tribes where there would be feuds back and forth and people murdered that all of a sudden the gospel comes in one of the tribes and we say, well, we're gonna go and do peacemaking and if they kill us, we die in the name of Jesus but if they don't, we can be at peace and maybe we can find peace and, and togetherness in the gospel. These are things like you heard on Friday night at the prayer meeting with, with Josh from Wyclef, Bible translation for unreached people groups where they're getting New Testaments in their heart language that they have never before had in the history of the modern world. And so much more. And I get excited about this because I know this is just the beginning. God is just getting started with what he wants to do, not by might, not by great intellect, not by power, not by great ability, but by his spirit. Amen. And if we want to see this awakening, we need holy power, which brings us to point number three. Number one, we crave power. Number two, we need holy power. Number three, we receive holy power for a holy purpose. I think many of us, we, we, like, we like this, this sort of uh, encouragement, this proclamation, this promise from Jesus, but you will receive power. You're like, yes, I like the sound of that. Thank you, Jesus. It's what somebody's been listening to me, baby. You hear that? You hear what Jesus said? Mm -hmm. I told you. I told you. Power. The question is why? Why? Jesus tells us. Look at verse eight. Jesus says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my what? Witnesses. Turn to your neighbor and say, Can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? He says, you will be my witnesses. See, to walk in this holy power, you need his mind and you need his agenda. Jesus did, need, did not leave it up to interpretation of your own mental happenstance, what this power is for. He told us explicitly, you're gonna get my power, then you're gonna be my witnesses. 
and the power and the kingdom that God has in mind will witness about him. Now, by the way, this word witness, this is not exclusively a religious word. This isn't exclusively a Christian word. This is a human word. People do this all, all the time. Let me give you an example. You're, you're there on the corner. You're going for a walk in your neighborhood. You're taking your kid in the stroller. And all of a sudden, God forbid, you see a car accident. Everybody's okay. Don't freak out. But, but you're there, and so you witness it. And so you get called to the courtroom, or you get called by a police officer, and they ask you if you can be a witness. You're like, what do I say? You tell them what you saw. You guys tracking with me? What does it mean to be a witness? You tell them what you saw. Well, I don't know what to say. You tell them what you saw. Jesus says, you're going to get boldness and power. What do I do? I don't know what to do. I don't know. Just tell them what you saw. Some of you are here, by the way, because a friend invited you. You're like, why did they invite me? Because they care about you. Because they've seen God work. They've watched God work in other people's lives. Maybe they've seen God work in their own lives. They've experienced such a, a life and a joy and a peace. And because they care about you so much, and because they think that you would really enjoy connecting with this God that's transformed their life, they love you enough to tell you what they saw. And you're here. We're reminded by Jesus that he is not building his kingdom on preachers. He's building his kingdom on witnesses. Jesus doesn't say you'll receive power and you're going to get a microphone, Michael, and you're going to come up here and preach right now. Would you like to do that? Yeah? Okay. You, no, no. <laughs> he was ready for a second. Jesus says you're going to be my witnesses. The whole purpose of a, 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 a large component of the purpose we have if we are still on this earth and we follow Jesus, and I realize I'm in mixed company here and some of you are not Jesus followers, and we're thrilled and honored that you're here with us, investigating God and faith and spirituality. But if you follow Jesus, he promised holy power for a holy purpose, which is to be his, come on, can I get a witness? You're like, John, witness it, come on. That's such like an archaic stance on how to talk to people. I mean, no one does that these days. You're right, we just don't call it witnessing. We call it posting or informing, right? You're like, people, John, pa Pastor John, people don't wit witness these days. Like, that's just not a thing that happens. Oh, really, have you been to a gas station lately? Hey, I'd like for you to sign my petition. I mean, I'm just trying to pump my gas. I know, I know, but this position is really important, you see, because in the floor of the gambling and the gambling money is going to go to the schools. And you really need to do this. And it's, it's absolutely important. It's going to change your life. Anybody else had that experience? Like, we live in a culture, just to be clear, humans witness. Humans witness. The problem is you only witness about what you experience and what you're passionate about. But we do it all the time. See, whatever you're immersed in, remember right before this, Jesus said, you're gonna be John baptized with water, verse five, but you will be baptized or immersed in the Holy Spirit. You will inevitably witness about what you're immersed in. You, 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 get, you get around, man, at this point, I have like a, the only face mask I have that's clean right now is my Miami Dolphins face mask. It like makes a little part of me dies every time I have to wear it now. I'm like, <laughs> But I run into any human being that has any shred of Miami Dolphins fandom in there, we start witnessing whoo, about the foolishness of the Miami Dolphins front office and the inevitable frustration and like, why are we Dolphins fans? Do we hate ourselves? What are we doing? You know, we start witnessing. Because whatever you're immersed in, I like football, whatever you're immersed in, you're gonna witness about. The application step is this, get immersed in his spirit and Jesus promised then you'll have power to be his witness. Our call is to experience his power and then share about his power. We want an awakening. We want righteousness and justice. We want his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And we know through book of Acts and modern history, it only happens like this. By prayer and repentance in response to hearing the good news of Jesus and the gospel proclaimed. Friends, I need to remind you, if you follow Jesus, and again, if not, you can just kind of listen in here, but if you follow Jesus, let me remind us as we celebrate seven years of Jesus, the CEO and king of Greenhouse Church, moving in this place, if you follow Jesus, we are not merely moralists, friends. We point people 
to Jesus. We don't just tell the world, man, you, you should be a better person, or you know what, you should really be against human trafficking, or you should really try to do what's right. All that is fine and all that's good, that's not what I'm saying, but it's not what brings the kingdom. It's not what brings awakening on the deepest parts of the human heart. It's only Jesus. He's the hero, he's the transformer, he's the CEO, he's the one who can do it, and it's his power to be his witnesses. And we need his power which means we've got to follow his plan. He said, wait, remember last week? He said, I've got this incredible mission, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth, yeah, but wait. Why? Because you need to be immersed in my spirit to have power, why? To be my witnesses. You're like, amen, Pastor John, you, you spit. I'm so glad they had that little space right there because you would spit on everybody. COVID protocol breach. You said, but life is, I, I, I want to, I, but life is hard. And, and so often I, I feel so weak, so powerless, so ineffective and unable to do the things I even want to do. By the way, there's a Bible verse that says that. Like, I, I, I'm, I feel so unable to do and to be who I long to be, which is why Jesus changes everything. Worship team, you guys can come up. We're gonna close and in just a moment here in a final co chorus. I came across a story this week as I was studying, and I'll read it to you now. It's a story of General Cagular. On the southern border of the empire of Persia, there was an emperor named Cyrus. In opposition to him, there lived a great chieftain named Cagular who tore to shreds and completely defeated the various detachments of Cyrus's army as they were sent to subdue him. Finally, the emperor... Cyrus, amassing his entire army, marched down himself, surrounded Cagular, captured him, and brought him to the capital as he awaited execution. On the day of the trial, he and his family were brought before the judgment chamber. Cagular himself carried himself with such bravery and nobility, even in the face of death, that he impressed Cyrus. Cyrus then said to Cagular, what would you do if I spared your life today? Cagular replied, your majesty, if you spared my life, I would return to my home and remain your obedient servant as long as I lived. Cyrus was intrigued. He continued, well, what would you do if I spared the life of your wife? Cagular thought for a moment and responded, your majesty, if you spared the life of my wife, I would not just live, I would die for you. So moved was the emperor that he freed them both and returned Cagular to his province to act as governor from that time after. Upon arriving at home, Cagular reminisced about the trip with his wife. Did you notice, he said to his wife, the marble at the entrance of the palace? Did you notice the tapestry on the wall as we went down the corridor into the throne room? Did you see the chair that the emperor sat on? It must have been carved from one lump of pure gold. His wife could appreciate his excitement, how impressed he was with all of it. But she only replied, I really didn't notice any of that. Well, Cagular said in amazement, what did you see? His wife paused for a moment and looked in his eyes deeply and said, I only saw the face of a man who said he was willing to die for my life. You're like, John, what's, why do you tell that story? Because I think as we talk about power, we, we know it matters. We know that it motivates so many of the decisions around us. And we know that it's an important force, but we also know something in us knows it's not the most important force. It's not the most powerful force. We know that at the end of the day, it's not just about power. It all comes down to, well, a force even more powerful than power itself. It's love. It's all about love. And I wanna connect the dots, friends, as we get ready to close out our time together and have a blast and celebrate and eat empanadas. I, I need you to know that when I'm talking about power and not just any power, but holy power, the right power, the power that we desperately need as human beings, I wanna connect the dots for us, friends. The only way we receive holy power is because he, Jesus, gave up his power for us. 
Scripture tells us that God so loved the world, that he so loved you and he so loved me, that he left his place of power in heaven, the rightful son of God, and he came down to earth and he ultimately gave up all power and gave up his life so that you and I can experience life. And if you're here, if you're watching online, you're thinking, how could I ever trust this, this God? Maybe you came in and, and you're not a follower of Jesus. Maybe you're not even a theist, but you walked in and, and so your, your heart's being moved for some reason. You're like, I don't even know why. I don't even believe any of this stuff. It's because God loves you. Maybe you're like, John, how could I ever trust this, this God that you talk about, his leadership, his directive power in my life? Because friend, he already gave up his power and his life for you. It's not a question, it's not a hypothesis, and it's not a gamble, it's a sure thing. He already proved it on the cross. And scripture says that to any who receive him, to any who are humble enough to acknowledge their need to say, you know what, I've been, I've been scrambling after power and I've even attained power and it has not worked like I thought it would and I can't do this on my own and I need some help. To anyone who gets to the point of humility and a willingness to reach out for help from heaven, he promises forgiveness, he promises peace, he promises freedom and holy power to live the life that you were created for and it is available today. Would you join me as we pray? You can bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment of quiet and privacy between you and God. I wanna give us a chance to respond. Maybe you're here this morning and you're watching online. Maybe you're watching even later on demand and, and something's stirring in your heart and it's been a tough season for all of us and maybe you've come to that point of humility. Maybe you've come to that point of desperation. Maybe you've come to that point where you realize, I can't do this anymore on my own. I don't have what it takes. I know I've been trying to act strong in front of everybody else, and I go home at night in my bedroom and I cry, but I let, can't let my kids see it because I'm barely holding it together. You don't have to do it alone any longer. He is the desire of your heart. He's the one that loves you more than any other person could ever on the planet. And everything you need is found in him, it's found in Jesus. If you wanna receive the forgiveness and right standing with God that only Jesus offers, I wanna give you a moment to do that right now. You're like, what do I do? You just look to heaven and say, God, I receive it. You do it right now, right here in the room, wherever you're watching online, God, I receive it. Jesus, I need you. I need your help. I need your forgiveness. I need your leadership in my life. I need your direction. I, I, I can't do this on my own anymore. Jesus, I need you. Forgive me, help me, change me. Before we're even done this morning, online or in the room, we're gonna have a bunch of our prayer partners up here. These are some awesome people, ordinary people just like you and I that love Jesus and have an incredible relationship with God that would love to walk with you on your faith journey and pray over you and encourage you. Before you leave this morning and go out and enjoy a bunch of the fun stuff we've got out there, give God a shot, respond. Maybe you're here and, and you're a follower of Jesus or at one point you were a follower of Jesus and you've kind of strayed away and, and you wanna respond to receive his power for his holy purpose to be his witness. Just tell him right now, say, God, I'm, I'm listening, you got me. Help me, change me. I don't wanna make my life all about me anymore. I wanna, I wanna follow you, Jesus. You came not to be served, but to serve. I wanna follow you, I wanna do the same, I wanna serve. You can look up at me and why don't we all stand to our feet. If I could ask our prayer partners to come up here and, and line the front, here's how we wanna close. I, I had strongly in my heart for the last two weeks now that you know we, ju we just culminated 21 days of consecration and prayer and fasting as a church. During that course of time, we've watched God do miracles. We've watched there be relational miracles. We've seen he healing miracles, people's physical bodies that have been healed miraculously by the power of God. We've seen God do some incredible things. I had a very strong sense that this morning for anyone that would be desperate and humble enough to say, man, I'll give this a shot. If you need a miracle in your life, before you go out and party and enjoy and celebrate, I want to invite you to come forward. We would love to pray with you. If you need a physical healing miracle in your body or for someone you love and care for, if you need a miracle with a relationship, if you need a financial miracle, if you need wisdom, you're like, I'm not sure which direction to go. I need God to speak to me. I believe that God wants to do some supernatural things. You're like, John, how would you even know? I don't even know what I believe. It's worth a shot. It's worth a shot.
And as soon as we sing, we'll close out in this final chorus. I wanna invite you to come forward and receive prayer for any of what we prayed about, for God to move in your life. Let's do it. Let's sing together. Sing. Let's sing, make me a vessel. Make me a vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. God, I came here with nothing, but all you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Sing, Jesus, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Because where, where there is new wine, there is new power, there is new freedom. And the kingdom is here, so I lay down my old flame to carry your new fire today. Let's sing that again. Where, where there is new wine, there is new power, there is new freedom. is here, so I lay down my old flame to carry your new fire today. So make us, Lord, make me a vessel, make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. God, we came here with nothing, but all you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Hey, we're going to close in just a moment here, but Alejandro, one of, the, one of the members of our worship team, he's been here a long time now, felt like God put something on his heart. And the scriptures it talks about when we come together is not just a you know, the sage on the stage pontificating from the mountain, but God gives gifts to his people and sometimes he chooses by his spirit to share something. And so Alejandro felt like he had a word of encouragement and, um, and I want him to share that now. Thank you. Hey everyone. So um, earlier during worship, we were just kind of praying and we were during worship thinking about all that God has done in the last seven years at Greenhouse. I've had the honor of being here for almost five years. Um, February 1st will be my fifth year. But um, really, God's done so many amazing things, but it's hard to kind of neglect the fact that so much has happened over the past two years in our community, even in this church, uh, and so many things that can affect our faith, um, so many things that can be detrimental. And um, I really just felt that the word that God had for, for our church was just like faith. Um, and really being faithful to him. And so I'm not really sure, I feel like this is, because it's been me and I'm sure that it's a lot of other people. Maybe you're at kind of like, you know, your last straw with faith, or maybe you just feel like this is not really working out. Um, and you're thinking about like, what's your next step? Do I go, do I stay? Not necessarily here at the church, I mean like, faith like what's going to be your next step and I really feel like the Lord wanted just to um, highlight Philippians 1 6 my phone is lagging so I'm not really sure where that's going um, but it, it's basically saying give me one second <laughs> Philippians 1 6 there we go thank you so much John <laughs> it says and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you, uh, because I hold you in my heart for all the partakers within me in grace, both in imprisonment and the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. Basically, know that the Lord is, he, if he began a good work, he's going to complete it. And um, that's the word that I got. Amen. That's good. That's good. Thank you, Alejandro. Hey, let me pray for us. Jesus, you've been so good. You've been so faithful. I, I, I think back, especially over the past two years, I mean, we were not able to meet here at Western High School in person for 14 months. 
I legitimately don't know how we're still here as a church, let alone in a healthy place, thriving and moving forward, seeing your kingdom come. God, your hand and your grace is the only answer I have. You've been so good. You've been so faithful. We love you, Jesus. It is a joy to celebrate what you've done over this past seven years as we look forward to what you have for the future. God, we say we are yours. We commit afresh our, our hearts to you, our church to you. Lord, this is all yours. This is all for you. Our lives are yours. Our time is yours. Our money is yours. This church is yours. God, use us. Make us a vessel. Our lives are an offering. Use us for your glory. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. Lord, I, I thank you for this church. I love this church so much. What amazing people you've blessed us with, God. What genuine hearts for you. Lord, I pray that you would bless them and keep them. Make your face shine over them and be gracious to them. Lift up your countenance upon them and give them your shalom, shalom, perfect peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you, church. Happy birthday. Stick around, enjoy some games and empanadas and take a picture with the family and enjoy some time together. And we'll see you in micro churches and right back here at Western next week. Love you, church. If you need prayer, you're welcome to come forward. I'll see you out there.